You have been listening to Lonely Waters by E.J. Moran. Now, those were the words spoken by a BBC announcer in 1943 that first awakened an interest in Moran's music to a young businessman named Lionel Hill. He got to know Moran and became a great enthusiast for his music, something he's never lost. At that time, hardly any of it could be heard outside the concert hall. But there were a handful of records, among them one containing a pair of songs which provided my own introduction to Moran's music. So, musical coincidences being what they are, when I was talking to Lionel Hill and we reminisced about those early records, it was no surprise to me to hear him say, long before I had time to mention the songs... Talking about 78, dear old 78, you know Dalfinia, Hedel Nash, yes, that marvellous singer, yes. Oh, yes, that will never be sung better again, ever. The song Diaphenia, which was my own introduction to the music of E.J. Moran. The whole question of what brings people to a particular composer's music is an interesting one. Sometimes merely a few bars are enough to cause immediate and permanent capitulation. That happened, most famously, to Eric Fenby when he switched on the radio one evening in 1928 and heard Delius's first cuckoo in spring. He was an instant convert to Delius's music. In Lionel Hill's case, as we've heard, the music was E.J. Moran's Lonely Waters. I asked other contributors to this programme, the conductor Vernon Handley, the pianist John Talbot, and the author Stephen Lloyd, what brought them to the music of this enigmatic man, half English and half Irish? I was at the university. I was at Oxford, at Balliol. I went up in 1951, and I went in for a little competition to decide the conductorship of the university students' orchestra. And one of the things that the um, then incumbent had put down for the next concert um, was the Moran Sinfonietta. And I went, went away and learned it. And I was captivated by it from then. And when I left university, I couldn't, uh, couldn't wait to get my hands on the rest of his music. I had actually studied the symphony um, just in my last year at school. And uh, that struck me then as being a strange and powerful work and the two works between them, when I came down from university, the symphony and the sinfonietta, sent me scurrying after all the rest of his pieces. I think it's very interesting the way Morin's music first seems to catch people's attention. For instance, I, I know of a number of people who've come across one work of his when they were young, and it sort of established a lifelong love, one could say, of his music. I know in my case, for instance, long before I became, had anything to do with music professionally, one of my piano pieces when I was a boy was the Moran Toccata for piano, and 
I fell in love with the middle section of that, which has a theme, a folk-like theme. And then a couple of years after that, I came across Peter Pears and Benjamin Bitten's recording of the song In Youth is Pleasure, which is a great performance of a very beautiful song. And things developed along those lines. Things come one's way, as it were. And this has been experienced for a number of people, I think. My first awakening to Amora's music was actually when I was at his former school, Uppingham, when my piano teacher put in front of me a piece, which looked fairly easy, on a May morning. And I tried playing it, and there was one sequence of descending chords that were a revelation to me. They struck me as something totally fresh and so redolent of the English countryside. And it was after that, seeking out the Heward recording of the symphony and that magnificent second subject of the first movement, which I must have worn the needle out and the records out with constant replaying. You know, when you come to those recordings as a, as a youngster, they are your only key to the works. And uh, I'm not sure that I had the score at, at school. I had, certainly had the score at university. Um, but it was a, a performance that I thought, especially in, in the little movement, the little scherzo, uh, couldn't be bettered. And I know that of the, the performances I've done of the Moran Symphony, which must number about a dozen now, as well as the record, um, I've always gone back in my mind to the accuracy of that first recording of the, uh, of the third movement. I've changed my mind a little bit about the uh, weight that Leslie Heward gave to different movements because I think the second movement um, is the heart of that piece and it has to be played with, a, with an extraordinary amount of devotion and passion. And I found it, it just held back a tiny bit. But then that may be because Heward had less Celtic blood than I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Vernon Hanley talking about Moran's perhaps best known work, his symphony in G minor, premiered in 1938 under the direction of Leslie Heward, from whose recording that extract came. Now, most people agree that if a composer is to be taken seriously, one of the things his music must have is its own individual sound. Moran's music is sometimes criticized for being, on the one hand, eclectic, and on the other, too dependent upon folk melody. I set myself to find the answers to these charges. Well, Moran certainly has an individual voice. I think we know that his awakenings to music were hearing folk song in the Norfolk pubs and also hearing, I think, the band playing on Cromer Pier. And certainly folk song is a, a very strong element in his music. But he doesn't just use folk song as so many other composers do in their rhapsodies. He uses the inflection and the shape of folk song as part of his own musical language. And this he very skillfully interweaves in many pieces, particularly works like the first Rhapsody, which doesn't overtly quote a folk song, but one feels the folk song influence there nonetheless. Many composers of that era, of, of that school, used folk song. 
uh, they tended to sort of spin these rhapsodies, but Moran, I think, went his own way, uh, using folk song, but in a particularly individual way, so that the folk song doesn't uh, stand there as the, the key element in any particular piece. I would agree with that. I think that he, he did achieve an individual voice in those last years, and this is apparent in his last works, the six poems of Seamus O'Sullivan, the cello sonata, the song Rahun, which he wrote for Kathleen Ferrier, and also the arrangements, his last group of folk song arrangements, the songs from County Kerry. And the derivations that we hear so much about, um, they don't worry you. One always finds, I think, a lot of talk about Moran's eclecticism, his use of the language or the sound world of composers who were active in his day and indeed in earlier times, say the Elizabethans. Um, I think it's probably fairly true to say that in, until f late in his career, he apparently needed to distill his musical thought through a sort of filter of the collective musical discourse of his own day. He absorbed these influences probably only half consciously and for very complex reasons, I should think. But one can always hear the music is Moran's. I, 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 I think this has to be said. He's not simply copying other composers' styles. One can hear Moran regardless of the particular composer who may be apparently influencing him in the piece he was writing at the time. See, is it one of the things that, that um, really annoys me very much? That this business of, of folk music and the folk music um, roots. Stravinsky takes an enormous amount of strength from the fact that his music is rooted firmly in Russian folk music. Bartok and Kodai take so much of their vigor from Hungarian folk music. Holston Vaughan Williams are weak because they have English folk music. You can't have one without having the other. It's, it's just ridiculous. It's all right if, if, if Beethoven or Mahler write a semi, a semi folk dance. Everybody says how absolutely wonderful it is. It takes you straight into the country. Um, but if you write an English dance into your music and all that, that weakens it terribly. Now, with Myron, there is a Sibelian approach to. To construction and composition, you know, the, 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 the themes tend to grow. Then there is um, a love of uh, what was now the British folk song, Discovery in Harmony. So there's a lot of, a lot of chordal movement. And then there is a, a colourful orchestration, which really is very French, how he skips from instrument to instrument and sometimes has most pointillist orchestration. But I think that every now and then, I mean, the, f the cello concerto is, is the exception to this rule. This extraordinary passion breaks out again. And you think, my word, th this man really meant this.
since he died over 40 years ago, there are not so many people still about who can say that they really knew him. Lionel Hill, his staunch friend for the last seven years of his life, is one, and John Beckett, music producer and harpsichordist, is another. He discovered a side of the composer that is often lost in discussions which tend to focus on the music. I first met him in the late summer of 1944 in Dublin. I had I'd just finished my last year at school, at a school outside Dublin, and I, 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 I took my music very seriously and I began to compose in my last three or four years at school. I composed quite a lot, and beginning to compose chamber music, and in the summer of 1944, the yearly Feshkill, which was a competitive music festival in Dublin, took place, and I submitted three of my songs in the composition class, and it turned out that a gentleman called E.J. Moran was the adjudicator. I hadn't heard of him at the time, and I was very pleased to receive the news from the Feshkill office subsequently that the songs had won the first prize and that was followed a week or two later by a letter from E.J. Moran himself saying that he thought the song showed talent and he'd like to come and meet me and I can see him now I was expecting to find a distinguished looking chap you know artistic and all that but in actual fact he looked like the sort of figure you'd find in a in a cattle fair in Kerry the old raincoat and the a rather battered general dress and the face and the stick and uh, he would have fitted in. I can see he fitted in absolutely in the street, in the markets, along the quays, perfectly easily. His face was a ruddy complexion, a battered face with a kind of visionary blue eyes looking out of it and his hair greyish and black also brushed straight back from his head. We sat down and we got talking about music a little. He told me that he was composing the Sinfonietta at the time. I was trying to write a string quartet movement and I showed him this and he was saying uh, how, how difficult it was to, to write well for string quartet. As he put it, what you must remember is that you're not writing for four string players, you're writing for 16 strings. I remember the remark he made about it. Then I, I told him that my plan was uh, this was in September. I, I was just about to go to the Academy of Music in Dublin for a year to study, and my hope was to get to the Royal College of Music in London after that year. And at that time, it was quite difficult to get into the Royal College, even to get considered for entrance to it, because there were a lot of still fairly young musicians, very talented people. George Malcolm was one of them, I remember. And uh, Edward Downes, I think, was another, who were coming back from the forces, and places were being reserved for them. And uh, Moran himself had been to the College of Music, so he had some connections there. And he was kind enough to write to the office of the director, Sir George Dyson, as he was then, recommending that I should be considered for a place. And I was, and I went, and I was accepted, and I went to the college, and I think myself, without uh, E.J. Moran's intervention, and that might not have come about. And when I was first in London, that was in September 1945, I was 18 at the time, I did see him occasionally. He took me to a little, in, in one of those houses, just as you come up to Swiss Cottage, there used to be big, rather ruinous old houses with gardens on the left, if you remember. And in the garden one of these was a little separate building, just consisting of one room. And he had a piano in that, and he used to compose that. He took me into that room, I remember was very kind to me. That was John Beckett, with a personal impression of the natural generosity of spirit for which Jack Boran was famous. The music we heard a few moments ago was the Adagio from the Cello Concerto, completed in 1945 and played by Moran's wife, Piers Coitmore, for whom he wrote it Con Amore. She and Moran had met briefly in the 30s, but then met again in 1943. Piers was 11 years younger than Moran, a busy professional cellist used to travelling all over the world giving concerts. She was by nature an extrovert, and although he was not, his undoubted love for her and his determination to compose music worthy of her talent smoothed what might have been a difficult path. Lionel Hill and John Beckett were each able to observe them together, and they give a realistic assessment of a strange marriage. Although, as Barry Marsh, Moran's newest biographer, says, the early portents were all good. There's a, a lovely letter written by Moran's mother 
to Piers just after she had been to tea at the family house in Kington. And she writes, I quite fell in love with you myself the very first evening you were here. And when I watched you and Jack together, I couldn't help wishing that you might be drawn nearer. My hope and prayer will be that after due deliberation, you may both feel that you will do well to spend your lives together. Well, a couple of years later, they did get married and they got married at Kington Parish Church in 1945. Piers, we like Piers very much. She, she was rather mannish and tomboyish in her. I mean, the first thing she did when she came down to our house in Bucks was to chase our young children all around the garden, you know, as if she was a man and all that kind of thing, screams of delight. But um, we sensed that somehow there was something funny about it. She was 100% a career woman, and uh, she was one of the stars of ENSA at the time, and travelling in the Middle East for the troops and all over Australia, you know, and all that, away from Jack. And the Casilla created nobody to keep him off his bad influences, you know, drink and that kind of thing. And she didn't seem to appreciate that a composer wants quiet. And she had this lovely little uh, muse flat up in Hampstead. I used to visit them both there, and I'd hear the old cello going, you know, as I went in. It's a lovely little place set in a lovely high brick wall and nice garden. And I often heard them practicing the cello concerto and the cello sonata. But she was always having her friends there, musical friends, you know, and all that kind of thing. Jack was never on his own. And, well, they gradually drew apart. He never lost his love for her, as my letters in my book show. I mean, he, when they dragged his body out of the river, her very last letter was found in his coat pocket. But uh, it wasn't a marriage made in heaven, I'm afraid. It, it, it seemed a rather, uh, how can I put it, a rather a strained relationship between them. For instance, we were in the village of Enniskerry, which is outside Dublin on the edge of the hills, and E.J. Moran suddenly said he wanted to see somebody down at the end of the village. The village is on a hill, and he stumped down with his stick <laughs> to the end of the village and came back after just about enough time to have a good stiff drink, <laughs> I remember it. And she seemed uh, a rather formal person. Oh, of course, I was a boy of 17. I, I didn't know her. I didn't know him. So I can't in any serious sense give an impression of what they were like. But I remember being with them and I remember a, an edginess about the, uh, the afternoon there. Piers Coitmore playing the cello sonata which her husband composed for her in 1947. When it comes to assessing Moran's output, individual preferences naturally come into play, though that sonata tends always to be placed high on the list. I think the cello sonata probably is his masterpiece, his most achieved work. It's still not as understood, I think, by musicians, and certainly not by the public, who don't get much of a chance to hear it. The string trio is probably, too, uh, one of his masterpieces. I would say the string trio and the cello sonata are the two most 
uh, accomplished and certainly the most deeply felt pieces. The Fantasy Quartet was written for Leon Goosens and is a short work, very attractive. It tends to revert perhaps to the sound of the string quartet in A minor. Nothing wrong with that, but it's not a major work in the sense that the pieces I've just mentioned are. The symphony is still the top of Moran for me because it, it attempted um, feelings and thoughts of a greater depth than any of the other or orchestral works. Um, and the violin concerto, because it is very, very successful as a violin concerto, that is a lovely piece to play, the violin, it has a terrific scherzo second movement, and th th there's a real um, virtuoso piece in the second movement. And yet he manages originally to bring it to a very satisfactory end with the most meandering last movement. But he does it structurally. He uses music from elsewhere in the, uh, in the piece. It was very interesting for me to get to know this concerto. I find it very, very beautiful and full of atmosphere, very lyrical work. It's a very uh, beautiful language, very poetical. And I always imagine that it's something to do with the nature. I think it's very good music. I like all of it, but I think the third moment is very strong. There's especially one phrase that moves me to tears. small output, I find every work worthwhile. So it, the, the outstanding works, you've got to um, shed things like Rhapsodies because they are not, um, they're not ambitious. And yet the first Rhapsody is so original and so, although there, there are a folk tune implications, nevertheless the, the rhythmic um, development of that little piece is really quite stunning. I and mean, I'm sure that if you played just that, to most people, they would never say it was Moiron because it is nothing but ferocity and drive and, and uh, uh, rhythmic difficulty. If you listen to his two early orchestral pieces in the mountain country and the first Rhapsody, you can hear all the elements of the later works. You can hear his voice, particularly in the first Rhapsody, very clearly formed. And from then onwards, I don't think his language changed much. The works became better, more finely honed, a better end product, but still, right from the start, the same more and voice coming through. The other thing about Moran in his essence, though, is that his music is what we might term um, music of an introvert, music of a, a depressive personality, uh, so that we don't listen to it purely for enjoyment. You, you can't listen to the cello sonata and just sit back. You, you are taken into a world of quite um, stark emotion. but. In that case, he does end on a positive note. The work ends on a major key and so on. He seems to have transcended the material that he's explored earlier on. A phrase that comes to mind 
not my own, but it was applied to Moran's, and I think it's very apt. The phrase is the consolation of sadness. I think that's something that Moran used his creative ability towards. I did have um, one long period of working with a, a young choir, youth choir, at Philida and Corridon. And that has become, for me, uh, one of the pieces I can't live without. Now, I don't know how often that is done, but I can't live without it. I think it's, it's uh, incredible writing, and that's partly pastiche. Although it rises to such a height of emotion that one can hardly say this is pastiche. And I think it is one of the most extraordinary pieces for encapsulating a whole area of British pastoral feeling. And very, very passionate pieces. And at times with great humour. Uh, it's not by any means turgid, that piece. From 1945 onwards, Moran was increasingly preoccupied with his second symphony. Progress on it was slow. He was a man who needed to be in the right surroundings to do his best work. In the case of this symphony, having started it in Ireland, he felt he had to be in Ireland to finish it. Something of his pride in having it underway, and yet something also of the frustration in not being able to get on with it, can, I think, be heard in Moran's voice in this brief interview from 1947. When speaking about his musical plans, the symphony was obviously in the forefront of his mind. For the immediate future, I'm planning a new symphony. I've just been down in County Kerry, at Kenmare, and transport is difficult, but I'm making plans to try and get back there. And I'm planning a new symphony, which I've been commissioned to write by John Bovarolli and the Halley Orchestra. And I want to write this symphony about the mountains of Kerry, and I'm planning to get back there and, and walk the mountains and think out the themes and then try and get on with the work and get it done. By 1949, the symphony was well advanced. Lionel Hill had helped at a crucial juncture with an ingenious suggestion that its projected three-movement form, about which Moran was growing increasingly doubtful, might work better turned into just one, rather after the manner of Sibelius's Seventh Symphony. After that, work on the piece resumed, and whatever doubts are held now about whether it was finished, they're not shared by Lionel Hill, nor by Barry Marsh. I'm pretty sure I'm right in saying that I must be one of the few people who heard the Second Symphony, which, when I heard it, was within a few pages of completion. And Jack seemed pleased with it at that stage. Once he'd altered the form after my suggestion to make it a one-movement work, he seemed to be more pleased with it. Was it going to be a lengthy work? Oh, yes, yes. A usual three-movement work. And furthermore, I quote a letter in my book that uh, he wrote to Piers where he said, the symphony is going fine. He said, I'm making a one-movement work of it. So he cottoned on to that idea. But I would say it was as long as the G minor. Really? Yes, I would. That's the tragedy. It was a thick manuscript that I saw on his piano. But not at all like the first symphony. Uh, completely different. As I say, there isn't a lot of Irishness in the first symphony, I don't think. There is occasionally. But this one is entirely Irish. It's got a, a, the usual slight Irish jig in the centre part of it, you know, just like in the violin concerto. He played it in the locals in the pub in Kerry. And uh, they applauded and they all loved it. They all said it sounded like all the Kerry tunes put together. And I bet that pleased Jack, you know. And for various reasons, um, he found himself in the wrong place at the wrong time when he wanted to complete it. 
he tried to go back to the country roots where he needed the inspiration. He couldn't live without the country. Piers wanted him to live in London, and he said, no, I can't stick the town for long. And so when he went into the country, he composed as much of the symphony as he could, sometimes in Ireland, sometimes on the Welsh borders. And by the time we get to 1948-49, uh, he's getting very hung up about the symphony. His letters show that he must go back to Ireland to complete it. This is when he's in London. And he used to get to the stage where he felt that the key of V-flat uh, was providing a curse. Uh, he knew that his model was Elgar's second symphony, The Spirit of Delight. And on one occasion, he came back to his brother and said, I can't work anymore on the symphony. Elgar's placed a curse on it. But if Moran did complete his second symphony, what happened to it? Here are two rather different theories, advanced by Barry Marsh and John Beckett, with a last word from Lionel Hill. I think he did complete the symphony. There are a lot of people who say, no, it wasn't completed. I think he completed the symphony because a close friend of his called Pat Ryan, who was the chief clarinetist of the Halle Orchestra, uh, spent the whole of the last year of Moran's life, the whole of the last summer of his life in Kenmare, discussing the work. And he said Jack Moran would never have talked about a fictitious work. In the manuscripts that are over in Australia, there exists the short score of a symphonic piece, which is about a 520 bars long, with indications for orchestration. This might be the symphony. It's being looked at at the moment, whether it can be brought to performance. If so, this would be wonderful, because it would show us what Jack Moran's last thoughts were. In his last years, he spent some time in a house near Delgany in, in Wicklow uh, with uh, Larry Morrow and Sheila Mahoney, who's quite near who we live, is inland, a bit pretty little village, just the edge of the hills. And I understand that E.J. Moran could use that as a pied à terre um, when he was in Allen but not in Kerry. And he was working on his second symphony there. And after his death, some journalists came to inquire about. Uh, whether any manuscripts are of the Second Symphony, and eventually a, a, a servant, a maid servant, who used to come in to clean or something, said, well, yes, uh, I did find some manuscripts, but they were in a dreadful condition, so I, I threw them out for decency's sake. <laughs> oh, it's an absolute tragedy. But there's always this hundredth chance that symphony will turn up. Touch wood. E.J. Moran died on the 1st of December, 1950. He had indeed returned to his lonely waters in his beloved county Kerry, where he was seen to fall from the pier at Kenmare into the water. The inquest concluded that he'd suffered a massive stroke. He left behind about two dozen orchestral and chamber works, besides songs, choral pieces, and a number of piano miniatures. Not a huge legacy and one which is tending to maintain something of a precarious hold on the repertoire. What, I wondered finally, would his ultimate reputation be? I think one always hesitates in using the word great with any composer or trying to rate them too highly. I think British music is particularly rich in music of a very beautiful pastoral element. One can turn to Delius, one can turn to Vaughan Williams, and Moran must come amongst that company. His voice is very individual. One can find faults in much of his music. The symphony in particular, or despite its beautiful moments, does have faults. Perhaps it could have been more thoughtfully held together. But nonetheless, when one hears his music, one is entering into the Moran world. He just missed the boat as a great composer because he died at 55.
he was just beginning to achieve some of his greatest pieces. I'm thinking of the cello sonata and the symphony in G minor. He produced some large canvas works. I think that in future years, people will always come back to his music because it's music of the outdoors. It's music that speaks directly to you without any asides. I don't think he will ever be regarded as a, a major composer, but I think if there was a second division, he would be right at the top. Well, I, I'm uh, noted as, as an enthusiast, but I'm afraid um, his reputation, unfortunately, will lie with the conductors, and nobody seems to take him up. It is just simply that he represents no sort of investment for the modern conductor. For the modern musician conductor, right, he represents a, a, um, an investment in great wealth, great richness. I don't think a, a, a month passes in my life but what I sing a piece of iron around the house, because of what it means to me. But conductors don't seem to take up Myron. Lonely Waters was presented by Lyndon Jenkins. You also heard the voices of E.J. Moran, Lionel Hill, John Beckett, Vernon Handley, Lydia Mordkovich, who was also the soloist in the recording of Moran's Violin Concerto, John Talbot, Stephen Lloyd, and Barry Marsh. The programme was first broadcast last December, the centenary of Moran's birth. The producer was Patrick Lambert.